In a statement from a cousin, you don't just see beauty when Suzanne is around, you feel it. Always with a sweet smile and a kind word, she has a peaceful presence about her. Let's talk about Suzanne Morphew's case and the fact that Barry Morphew's cousin Amber is speaking out, claiming Suzanne was not a victim of DV. Let's also speak about what the deputy district attorney told me and what he denied me because the Morphew matter is currently an open investigation. We're going to continue to dig more into day one of the Barry Morphew preliminary hearing from August 9th, 2021. We're going through the court transcripts. You guys, if you've been looking for them, I'm putting them back up. I think this is video number two out of seven. So Judge Ramsey Lama had ordered that all of the preliminary hearing info from Barry's case be released. And, you know, I wanted to see Barry in all these videos. We've seen the photos here flailing his hands about, you know, trying to make excuses trying to come up with all sorts of stories to tell FBI agent Johnny Grusing about why things seemed contradictory in his story. So you guys know I've been sending in all types of freedom of information requests for many cases. I wanted to see all these interviews and interrogations of Barry Morphew. So I've been attempting to get all the unreleased evidence that Judge Lama ordered to be released. In the case of the people of the state of Colorado versus Barry Lee Morphew. Judge Lama presided over the case and he ordered the release of certain evidence like audio, interviews, photos, which were all presented during the preliminary hearing. Now, according to reporter Lauren Scharf, on January 26, 2022, she said she just spoke with the Chafee County Court Clerk about the judge's order to release all the body cam video footage and everything from Barry Morphew's prelim to the public. It would likely take weeks because they were trying to figure out how they could share it at that point. The court clerk told Lauren that was their first time dealing with anything, of course, of this scale. Now, we heard a lot of stuff in the prelims. It's been two years, and I'm trying to remember everything we heard. I already received a DVD containing all the body cam footage you guys have seen. I've linked to that below. But I wanted to hear the rest of things. I could have sworn they played certain things during the prelims that I heard, if I'm not mixing it up with a gazillion other cases I'm researching, where it was hard to hear the audio. It was farther away, I do believe. I believe it was some of the spy pen recordings Suzanne Morphew inadvertently recorded. I could be wrong, but I wanted to get that stuff. Well, I just got a reply to my request for all the body-worn camera footage, all the audios of interviews, everything played during during Barry Morphew's trial that the judge had ordered was okay to release to the public. Once again, I tried to get the 911 call supposedly made to Salida Police when everyone discovered Suzanne Morphew was missing on Sunday, May 10th, 2020, around 5.46 p.m. But I got a reply from Mark Hurlbert, Hurlbert. his name makes me laugh, Mark Hurlbert. 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 Why is that so hard to say? Deputy District Attorney. He told me, District Attorney Stanley has asked me to respond to your request. At this time, I'm denying your request for body-worn camera footage, interviews, 911 calls in the Morphew matter. Pursuant to all this Colorado law, criminal justice record and dissemination, blah, 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 the custodian of records may deny such an inspection if it is contrary to public interest. Release of the body camera footage Footage, audio of the interviews and 911 calls would be contrary to public interest. The Morphew matter is currently an open investigation. Releasing the information you requested would compromise that investigation. Further, should a person be arrested and prosecuted in this matter, release of the body cam and interview footage would deny that person their constitutional right to a fair trial. For the above reason and pursuant to Colorado statute, I am denying your request. So truth be told, I can't remember everything that was played during those four days of the prelim hearings based on what we're missing, based on the body cam footage they gave us. I know we don't have any audio interviews and stuff like that, but this is probably a good thing. I'm not going to push or anything. Even though Judge Lama ordered everything we heard in the prelims to be released, it proves that the DA, the deputy DA, everyone is taking this seriously enough. They don't want to taint a jury. They don't want to take any chances. You know, this case has gone through the ringer enough, but I'm thinking we'll see those interrogations of Barry in due time. Can you imagine Barry telling Johnny Grusing, I thought you were my friend after he got arrested. 
Amber Heifner Amen, the second cousin, speaks out about Suzanne. This is the controversy. But anyway, Barry's cousin has spoken out in this newly released statement after Suzanne was found. I don't know when it was originally written, but it's now newly circulating. You know, thanks to the Redditors and Tube Crime over on YouTube, we see this recently released public Facebook reply, which Amber wrote, quote, Suzanne was not a victim of DV. That was a made up rumor by her brother who has since retracted his statement. So I don't remember Andy Mormon specifically going on any platform and saying, oh, you know, any of those illusions I said about Suzanne working with a DV shelter or being a DV victim. Forget all that guys, I was totally wrong. I don't remember Andy saying that, not that I've seen. Amber continued, Ellie found no signs of abuse from Barry towards Suzanne. That's what Amber is claiming. But the upcoming court transcripts from Barry's prelim hearings, they say differently. The arrest affidavit says differently. Stuff that came out of Suzanne's own mouth. To her sister, the text message you remember, to her best friend, Sheila Oliver, they say differently. Quote, Amber said, they did, however, state Suzanne was physical with Barry and often that Barry would walk away from the situation. That wasn't pulled out of thin air, Amber wrote. Suzanne was very much manipulating the entire situation and everyone around her. She didn't not love Barry. She just wanted to love Jeff too. Why didn't she say Suzanne loved Barry? Amber wrote, this isn't to talk bad about Suzanne. It's just the facts. Someone who is in an abusive relationship where they live in fear doesn't have the freedom Suzanne had. And there's nothing wrong with having the freedom, she countered. What's wrong are the choice she made with it. Huh. <sighs> Yeah, I agree adultery is wrong, but that is victim blaming at its finest. No wonder this statement is circulating everywhere and making people's heads spin. I expect those type of statements to ramp up now that Suzanne's remains have been found and Barry and his family are likely shaking in their boots and wondering, you know, what evidence from her remains? Could they point to him as perpetrator or someone else? We don't know. It's something that's been done in other cases. A lot of victim blaming it. The vitriol turns to the victim you know, once the perpetrator gets nervous. But despite what Amber thinks and what she's written, the 2021 Colorado Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board listed Suzanne Morphew's name in the report that's dedicated to 39 victims who died in Colorado in 2020 due to domestic violence or occurring within the context of domestic violence. To victims and survivors everywhere and to those who work every day to prevent these deaths. Plus, in the upcoming transcript, you'll hear that I I recorded previously but deleted i'm putting back on youtube now you'll hear in day one the court transcripts from monday august 9th 2021 you'll hear that suzanne very much thought that barry was the aggressor and that the five foot four inch tall suzanne who weighed around 115 pounds did in fact live in fear of the five foot 10 inch tall 175 pound Barry. There's many instances of it, not just in these transcripts, but in a lot of court documents and a lot of her own text messages. There's talk coming up of Suzanne's spy pin purchase, sending it to her friend so Barry wouldn't see it. How Mallory feels responsible for Barry's happiness, which is sad. And how a then 16 year old Macy had a conversation with Suzanne about potentially taking out a restraining order against Barry. Now these are facts that came up in court from witnesses. Suzanne wrote about her girls, my heart aches for them both in different ways. And then best friend Sheila Oliver in the court transcripts will talk about helping Suzanne figure out her next steps. But Suzanne does admit to feeling unequipped unequipped for leaving Barry. Suzanne told her friend Sheila about Barry being a narcissist and more. Barry did not think Suzanne could make it on her own. At least he probably hoped she couldn't, but once she got the resolve to try and end the marriage, that's when she disappeared. Suzanne described Barry's personality as a Jekyll and Hyde. At one point in the transcript, they're gonna say, oh, Barry would fly into a rage, but then Iris Eaton, his lawyer, keeps objecting and asking to strike and wanting certain details and exact times and page numbers. It's like she couldn't necessarily battle against the facts, so she kept asking for exact times. When is the exact time stamp of that text? Suzanne said of Barry, he won't speak of divorce. 
and she even wrote to her friend, he threw the 70 times seven at me and people wondering where that comes from. That's a scripture, Matthew 18, 21 through 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times will my brother sin against me and I forgive him and let it go up to seven times? <laughs> Peter was a trip. Jesus answered him, I say to you, not up to seven times, but 70 times seven. So I believe Jesus was saying, we'll forgive a lot. So Barry was pressuring Suzanne to forgive him often, but how often did he forgive her? They'll talk about the first time Jeff, Libler, and Suzanne hooked up at that party many, many years ago. Barry was not at the party, but Barry and Suzanne were dating. Then years later came that howdy stranger message that Suzanne would send to Jeff, and eventually they started meeting up in person. They met up in New Orleans. They're going to talk about in this portion of the court transcripts. They fooled around, but allegedly didn't have sex that time they would go on to in different cities. Also that critical last week of Suzanne's life is discussed. I believe it was the last week. I believe she was gone to heaven by May 9th. But around May 6th, Suzanne had told Jeff it would be a rough week because it would just be her and Barry in the house because the girls were out of there. Suzanne had just dropped Macy off at Mallory's place in Gunnison because they were going on a road trip. But Jeff, during those last critical texts, asked Suzanne, do you want to strip down and get naked? While his wife was at Costco and his daughter was out running. Oh man, Suzanne messaged him back. I'm on WA for WhatsApp. So these were the last text from Suzanne and the exact times they're going over coming up in the transcripts that Suzanne's communication stopped. And so when you compare that to Barry's truck times, it's very suspicious. They'll talk about when Barry called uh, their family godly and that Suzanne was a believer. And if one person got saved from this, she would think it's okay. And that part when Jeff Libler heard about Barry say that because it was on the news, it's coming up. You'll hear Lauren Scharf and her excellent reporting capture all this. Jeff thought that was weird. So Barry saying it's just a tragedy. If one person got saved from this tragedy, Suzanne would think it's okay. As if she would think what is okay? Her murder? Suzanne's friends, they sound great. Holly Wilson and Sheila Oliver worked with police ultimately. Some of them did it on their own to secretly record Barry, get him on tape, try and get info. So they talk about the spy pen recordings catching Suzanne telling Jeff that he's the one she loves. And she also said, I think we're in the clear for Valentine's Day since Barry should be somewhere else. And they even talk about some kind of trouble Suzanne had with Barry's sisters. So I can't wait till we get all these interviews and all these details. Now, I know, I believe Barry's cousin, you know, she's been posting a lot of scriptures and we know Barry is allegedly a believer too. So I thought I've got to stick this Proverbs 16, five in here. I've been going through Proverbs a lot. It's so full of wisdom. So before we watch this upcoming court transcript, Proverbs 16, 5, everyone who is proud and arrogant in heart is disgusting and exceedingly offensive to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. So yes, we do have to be careful. We have to be careful. We don't want to throw too much blame. We don't want tunnel vision. We don't want to say, oh, it's got to be this person who committed the crime. No, we do have to look at all aspects. We have to look at all avenues. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, until they confess or what have you. We have to be careful about pointing too much blame at one person unnecessarily. We can use our minds, of course, and look at all the evidence and how much it's conflicting and how much it does point red flags waving towards one person. But at the same token, that does not mean we take up the gauntlet for this person and, you know, start blaming the victim. To me, it's kind of like, it would be like saying, oh, Nicole Brown Simpson, what was she into? You know, and I've, I've seen it happen. You know, did she bring that upon herself? What was she doing? And, you know, it, it, it gets very unseemly and it gets very tacky and tawdry. So my point is we don't unfairly blame someone if we don't know who committed a murder. But at the same token, we don't, you have to be careful about, you know, sticking your flag. Oh, I really believe this guy and he's 
gotta be telling me the total truth and Suzanne was the manipulative one and she you know when it starts going that far it doesn't have to go that far I think the safest bet would be to say I'm going to examine all the evidence I'm going to see what the evidence tells me like cops say the crime scene tells the story the victim tends to lead you towards the perpetrator it's one thing to kind of take that middle ground and wait and see it's quite another to stand so staunchly behind a person like Barry that you start insulting Suzanne Morphew, who is definitely a victim, who I definitely believe. As God is my witness, I believe she was a victim of DV. And I'm seriously praying every day that whoever the perpetrator is, is arrested and convicted and that the truth comes out. So I just had to put this little intro out there before we go into the next set of court transcripts. If you haven't seen the other one, I published the first one I did in the most recent video. Check out the playlist. This will be number two. I think I have five more to go and then we'll be done with this series and the court transcripts will all be back online. And let's hope before long, we'll be watching Barry in all these interviews and interrogation videos, getting to see and witness what he said and did. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe to Plunder. Okay, once again, we're going to continue going through snippets of Barry Morphew's preliminary hearing. This was from the first day, Monday, August 9th, 2021 before Judge Patrick Murphy. We're going to hear a lot asking questions on the side of the prosecution, Jeffrey Lindsay. We'll also hear from Barry's lawyer in this section quite a bit, Iris Eaton, and of course Barry Lee Morphew is present, but FBI agent Kenneth Harris is the one primarily being asked questions in this portion that we'll cover today. Once again, I ordered these court transcripts day one and day two thus far directly from the court through Chafee County and they use a third party to transcribe what was actually said in court. I am allowed to reference these court transcripts. I am not allowed to upload the full documents anywhere or share the full documents anywhere with anyone. I can't upload it to a website and have you guys read it all there yourselves. I cannot send someone 50 pages of this PDF. I am allowed to reference it though. The court transcriptionist service told me that of course if anyone wants the full document they have to go through the same process that I did pay $321 for both documents access the full documents that way but since I'm allowed to reference them I'm going through just different sections pulling out what's interesting let's start here by Mr. Lindsay agent Harris the first series of texts were September of 2019 anything changed between September 2019 and March of 2020 as it relates to Suzanne and the relationship she's having with Sheila? I don't know if this is what you mean. They had met in February of 2020 in Florida, which was the context in which Sheila brought the spy pin and the context in which they were talking more about some what-if plans for Suzanne. What is she going to do if she needs to get out of the marriage? So that was, I think, around February 4th of 2020. And she, did she say that the spy pen was one of those things to use to try and get out of the marriage? or as a tool. Yes, primarily just to be able to see whether or not Barry was having an affair or what he was doing. Mr. Lindsay, Judge, can we publish 18 through 26, please? Judge, yes, that's fine. Mr. Lindsay, so Agent Harris, just to take a quick tour of this, again, a reference to Macy. Macy and I had a very tough talk yesterday. See that? I do. That box of Suzanne's? Yes. Sheila Oliver tell you what about that conversation that she's having with Suzanne Morphew? Suzanne talked about the fact that, you know, she and Macy had had specific conversations again about Macy having a friend who had been, had divorced parents and things were fine. So they were talking about that as a possibility for Barry and Suzanne to separate and still be happy. And it seems to me like Macy is getting a little bit more information than Mallory. Is that consistent with what Sheila Oliver is telling you? Yeah, just because Macy is still at home with Barry and Suzanne and Mallory is in college in Gunnison. Miss Eaton, objection, foundation. How does Sheila know the information that this agent has? Judge Murphy. 
Murphy. Okay, when you talked to Sheila, did she give you, did she talk to you about how she knew these things? The witness. Yeah, Sheila talked about their continued conversations about their relationship. And they saw each other several times between 2019 and 2020, in addition to all their text, phone, Snapchat conversations. I can detail. I can try to detail from when those trips were when they saw each other as well. Judge Murphy. How often did they talk? either by phone or text. The witness. Sheila said it was pretty much, it was pretty much every day. There may have been gaps, but it's something where they were talking almost every day in one context or another. Judge Murphy. Okay, so I think that's a sufficient foundation. Ms. Eaton. Thank you. I just thought that he was kind of talking information about her understanding of Sheila and Suzanne, not Sheila and the girls. Judge Murphy. That's the way I understand it, Mr. Lindsay. Exhibit 19, please. I'm going to focus in. Quote, my heart aches for them both in different ways. End quote. Agent Harris, the context of that from Sheila Oliver, what is she telling her? What is Suzanne telling Sheila Oliver? Who are them? So, she's talked with Suzanne at different times about the different challenges for Macy and Mallory and that her, she struggles. Her heart aches for them in different ways. Macy, because she's in the house. Mallory, because she feels like, and there's a text that states this, that Mallory sort of feels like she's responsible for Barry's happiness. And so there's different shapes to their struggles, and Suzanne feels that. People's 20, please. So the first text box is a blue text box, and Sheila talks about, quote, have you looked to next steps if you move toward getting out? End quote. And Suzanne's response is, she says, not really, I laid out there, but what is Sheila's understanding of that response? What's the, what's holding Suzanne back, according to Sheila, when she says, quote, not really, I feel unequipped, end quote. The two primary things were just figuring out where she would live, how she would support herself, what it would actually look like logistically for her to separate. And then there's a reference with dealing with a narcissist. Who is she talking about there, according to Sheila? They had talked about Barry having narcissistic tendencies. 21, please. First text box as you get down to the second paragraph. Quote, probably, he probably thinks I'm not strong enough to deal with. Who is he? according to Sheila, the one at the far left. Oh, sorry, that's referring to Barry. And then reference finances. What is she talking about there, according to Sheila? Yeah, Suzanne was aware that, in part, Barry thought that she couldn't go out on her own. You know, whether it's paying for where she's going to live or how she's going to work or the health insurance for her cancer like we talked about previously. Are you aware? Did Sheila tell you during this time frame, Agent Harris? whether Suzanne was undergoing cancer treatment during this time frame? Yes, we talked about in their text conversations, there's quite a few photos of Suzanne when she's in the middle of her chemo treatments that she's sending to Sheila. And we were both looking at that. And she was saying, quote, this is all going on while she's also battling cancer. And to some extent, looking at that middle text box, Agent Harris, Suzanne's text seems to indicate that Macy is actually becoming an advocate for her. Does Sheila talk to you about that part of this relationship? Just the fact that Suzanne had talked to her in text and conversations about the fact that Macy was encouraging her to think about going out on her own and separating. Go to 22, please. First text box there on the left, Agent Harris. Yeah, when we have a restraining order and then we have like a sad face emoji, it says, quote, I'm sick. I had a conversation like that with my 16-year-old, end quote. Agent Harris, did Sheila Oliver talk to you about this line of text during your conversations with her? Yeah. And later on, she refers to Macy. Specifically, Sheila does. And that this is talking about the fact that Macy mentioned to Suzanne possibly getting a restraining order and that Suzanne was, didn't feel great about having those conversations with her 16-year-old daughter. Go to 23. Talk about the left there. That first screenshot. You see that? I do. It goes a little bit further. Quote, pretty much totally can't be healthy seeing this. End quote. What is this according to Sheila Oliver? It's their marriage. Does she ever talk about this Jekyll and Hyde piece that Suzanne puts in her text message? Yeah. What does Sheila tell you about that? Yes. 
Sheila talked about the fact that Suzanne refers to Barry that way, meaning, again, he could just sometimes be just in a rage and really angry, and there were times where he was calm. Miss Eaton, objection. I don't know where. I'd ask the witness to describe where Ms. Oliver says that he gets in a rage. Judge Murphy, is that something that Miss Oliver told you? The witness, I don't know if that, that was. I don't remember if that was her word or not, so. Mr. Lindsay, well, maybe just the context is some. Miss Eaton, I'd move to strike unless the witness can point to us where his witness said that. Judge Murphy, well, again, we're not in front of a jury, so I don't think we need to strike anything. Can you ask the question maybe a slightly different way? Mr. Lindsay, did Suzanne talk about the sort of split personality? I mean, I mean, Jekyll and Hyde is like the what everybody thinks of as a split personality. Right. Did Suzanne talk to that, to Sheila about that? And Sheila understand what that is? Yes. Suzanne talked about the Jekyll and Hyde being, you know, this responsive, angry side, and then sometimes calm. And again, we're still in March. I believe that middle box pretty much told him it can't be healthy seeing this. Again, talking about the relationship. What about the healthy part? What does Sheila know about Suzanne's health? Again, this goes back to her struggling both mentally and physically, primarily with the effects of cancer, and feeling like the relational stress was just continuing to take a toll on that. And Agent Harris, if we move off to the right there, there's a text message from Suzanne that says, quote, he will make a scene and use the players. Who does Sheila know to be? What are the players? The players, again, this is where he's pulling the girls in. Mallory and Macy. Mallory and Macy, yes. Interesting middle part here says, quote, talking to anyone about our marriage like friends, end quote. Go back. It says, quote, he also asked me if I'm talking to anyone about our marriage like friends, end quote. What does Sheila Oliver know that is or understands that to mean? Yeah, Suzanne said that Barry had pressed her as to whether she was talking to anybody about what was going on in their marriage. Friends, you know, telling any details about what was happening and going down that next text message. She says to Sheila, quote, he won't speak of divorce. I'm torn. In my heart, I know who he is. Unpack that a little bit for us, according to what Sheila tells you, Agent Harris. Yeah, so Sheila knew that they had, Suzanne had had, conversations with Barry about wanting to leave. She said she didn't know whether or how often she'd used the word divorce, but pointed to this text saying that Suzanne had at least referenced the fact that Barry wouldn't talk about divorce with her. And then we move down a little bit further, the bottom right, it says, he threw the 70 times seven at me. Independent of your conversation with Ms. Oliver, Agent Harris, do you know what 70 times seven actually is? So I believe this is a reference to the instruction in the New Testament about how many times somebody should forgive someone else. And does Sheila understand and that also to be a scriptural reference according to her conversations with you? Yes. I don't know whether we talked about the 70 times 7 specifically. She did talk about the fact that Suzanne would often say Barry would use scripture where she was supposed to forgive, but, you know, didn't seem to look at the places where he needed to ask for forgiveness. If we can go to 25, please. So when we're looking at 25, it speaks for itself. We can move to 26, please. In the context of this text message between Sheila and Suzanne, if you could start at the last text box on the far left and work your way to the middle one, ending with, quote, makes me wonder what the young me was thinking. What does Sheila Oliver understand that to mean, Agent Harris? That Sheila and Suzanne had just talked at this point about in the struggle of their marriage. You know, Suzanne would often look back and just was trying to wonder exactly what she says. What was the young me thinking in terms of getting into the marriage in the first place? Then, if you follow over to that middle text message, quote, I have regrets, but Mal and Macy are the sweetest parts of this. Yeah. What did Sheila understand her relationship with those two girls was? Sheila understood that the girls were in many ways the center of Suzanne's world. And so, you know, she remembers getting this text 
and just the fact that, you know, after all the struggles Mallory and Macy were something that she had, of course, no regrets for and that her life was focused around. So Agent Harris, if we can now kind of change topics here and talk about the agent's interactions with Jeff Libler. You said you came to know Jeff Libler first off through the spy pen and did some research and eventually caught up with him in Michigan and interviewed him. Yes. And when you interviewed him, did he tell you the first time that Suzanne and him had actually sort of come together? Yes. Do you mean with... So he talked about when they first met each other. They knew each other in high school and that I believe it was high school in Indiana. Yes, high school in Indiana. Okay, and I believe it was the... I'm not positive of this, but I think it was the summer of 1989, which was the year after Jeff Libler's first year in college. He was back in Indiana for a party, which was at Suzanne's house. Barry was not there, but Barry and Suzanne were dating at that point. And he and Suzanne sort of hooked up at the party. And there was another contact about 20 years later? Yes. So in some time, he didn't remember when it was exactly, and he did not have the records for it, but believed it was around, he said, fall of 2018. I think he thinks around September that he got a message that just from Suzanne that said, quote, howdy stranger, end quote. When he received that text, did he remember who she was? Yes. Then what did he do in response to that? So they eventually exchanged messages and then started talking on the phone primarily. Okay, the phone, the actual dial-up phone. Yeah, audio calls. Okay, what are some of the things that they initially start talking about according to Mr. Libler? So they reconnected and they talked about various shared interests, whether it was, you know, books that they liked or music that they both enjoyed. So it was sort of like the beginning was just a reconnecting of people that hadn't seen each other since high school. She actually talked to him about her cancer, the cancer treatment she was undergoing. Eventually, yes. He said about three weeks after they started talking that she sent him some lab reports because she knew that he worked in the pharmaceutical industry and their conversation had gotten to the point where she sent lab reports and asked his opinion about what she could do. And then does it become more than platonic at some point or another? Yes. Do you recall roughly when that happened? The first trip where they were together physically was in New Orleans in February of 2019. According to Mr. Libler, they did not have sex on that trip, but fooled around in the hotel room. And did they continue into Florida? Indiana, Michigan, and Dallas? Yes, they've got several trips in the course of 2019 where they meet up in different places. Then do they change their means of communication in December of 2019? Yes. And why did they do that? Suzanne mentions that Barry is very curious. Curious is not the word, but he's looking at her communications, and so they go to communicating on primarily LinkedIn, and then also by WhatsApp. As we move into 2020, is there another get-together there in 2020, the early part? Yes, in Florida in February. Was there also another reason for Ms. Morphew to be in Florida in February 2020? Yeah, she was visiting her father, Jean. They start talking about mutual interests at some point or another. And what are those mutual interests? Separate and apart from what you've already said just a few questions ago. Yeah, again, they primarily talk about books, they like to read, music that they have an interest. And then because they're in, she's in Colorado, Jeff suggests taking up mountain biking to her. So in March of 2020, that's when they talked about that. I don't remember the first time that they, if it was in March, the first time they talk about mountain biking, but you are aware the investigation revealed that Ms. Morphew bought a mountain bike around that time. Yes, if you could move to May 6th, Agent Harris, and just so we can all understand, the week of May 5th into May 6th, all the way to May 10th. How are you guys looking at that week as part of your investigation when you're looking at the victimology of this case? So when the week of May 6th, so I don't know what the Monday is. May 6th, I believe, is the Tuesday. We know that May 5th 
is the day that Suzanne drops Macy off in Gunnison at Mallory's place to begin their road trip. And so when she returns from that point until May 10th, it's just Barry and Suzanne in the house. So it becomes an important context just because they're the girls are not there, they're by themselves. And is there also discussion with Jean Ritter about that week and information that Suzanne had given her about the week of May 6th? Yes, specifically a comment that, so Jean and Suzanne would sometimes have coffee and on the morning of May 6th, they had coffee and Suzanne told her, don't plan on coming by this week because I'm going to be busy with Barry's books for work. So let's focus on May 6th. Anything between Ms. Morphew and Mr. Liebler about that week sort of looking forward yes there is a message I don't have it in front of me on the LinkedIn messages between Suzanne and Mr. Liebler in which Suzanne tells him on May 6th something about could you stay with me longer it's okay if you can't it's going to be a rough week just know that these next few days will be rough yes sorry was Miss Morphew sending photos to Mr. Liebler she was. Let's now move to May 9th. You recall a series of messages made back and forth between Miss Morphew and Mr. Liebler on May 9th? I do. Let's talk about the message at 2.04.41. 1404.41. Yes. So at 2.04, I don't have the seconds on the version I have, but at 2.04, Jeff sends something to Suzanne saying, quote, how did you get a loan? Judge, I'm sorry, said what? The witness, how did you get a loan? Judge, a loan? Witness, uh-huh, Mr. Lindsay. What is the context of that, according to Mr. Liebler? That Barry had left. And does Suzanne respond? Yes, at 2.04 as well. Again, I don't have the seconds in front of me. Suzanne responds to Jeff, quote, he's always gone somewhere. It never stops. Miss Eaton, judge, I just don't know if they're the LinkedIn messages that he's, that the witness is describing. Did he talk to the witness about the LinkedIn messages? I missed that part, Judge Murphy. So the answer he just gave, I assume, is straight from the message. It is, judge. And the second question was, you were asked earlier, what did Mr. Libler mean when he said, how did you get a loan? And you answered, did you discuss these messages with Mr. Libler? We did, judge. Okay, Mr. Lindsay. Does she continue on into 205 all the way to the end of 205, Agent Harris? Yeah, she responds. And again, just so we're clear, you're reading the messages that law enforcement obtained through your LinkedIn search warrant. Yes, Okay, yeah. At 2.05, after he's always gone somewhere, she says, quote, fine with me. Keep going, please. I'm sorry. Then at 2.11, Suzanne, wait a minute. Do you have a message at 2.05? I do not. Not in the list that I have. I have, quote, fine with me at 2.05. I don't have all of the LinkedIn messages in front of me. Do you recall whether she texted or linked in messaged him, quote, thank you, babe at 2.05.13? Off the top of my head, I do not. May I approach the witness? Yes. The question was the string of LinkedIn messages at 2.05. 2.04 into 2.05. Yes. Yeah, there's a couple more. Quote, fine with me at 14.05.01. Thank you, babe, at 14.05.13. I'm just in love with you at 14.05.20. Judge, can you? I don't know who these texts are coming from and going to. Witness, these are all from Suzanne to Jeff. Judge, okay, you said there was one that said, thank you, babe, and then the next one? Witness, yes, sorry, quote, I'm just in love with you. That one is at 1405.20. Then one last one that's in the 1405.46 is, quote, what you up to? I'm sorry, you talked a little bit down into the, sorry, I didn't hear what you said, that last one. Quote, what you up to is at 1405.46. Whatcha is spelled W-H-A-T. C-H-A. Okay, is there more messages in between Suzanne and Mr. Libler in that afternoon? Yes, 
Jeff responds at 14.06.03. Okay, what's his response? That he was, I don't know if this is a quote, that he was cleaning up outside and that his wife just went to Costco and his daughter went running. He, that's supposed to be a summary. He then asked, quote, want to strip down and get naked? LOL. And that's a message from Mr. Libler from Jeff to Suzanne. To Suzanne. At 140603. Communication continue on? It does. Suzanne responds, oh man, with two exclamation points at 140730. And then Suzanne responds again, quote, can you talk? With two question marks at 140738. Then Suzanne has two more responses, quote, or video at 140744. Then she says, quote, I can load up W-A at 14.0802. And what do you understand W-A to mean from your investigation in this case? The application WhatsApp. What time was that message on LinkedIn? 14.0802. Okay, are there any more messages from Suzanne? Yes. To Mr. Liebler or vice versa? Yes. Jeff responds, I don't have the specific time for this, but he's got to check on his kids and see whether he's able to. Then Suzanne responds with just the word written out, okay, okay, a y at 14, 11, 21. Then Suzanne also responds, I'm on W-A at 14, 11, 25. 14, 11, 25. So that means 2, 11, 25 seconds p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Yes. Any more responses from Suzanne to Mr. Liebler? No. That's her last communication on LinkedIn. Any more responses you're aware of to anyone? Ms. Oliver, Melinda, her sister, her friend, Polly, her children, Jean Ritter, Mr. Morphew. Any more electronic responses sent from Ms. Morphew's phone? email to anyone out there on the planet earth not that i'm aware of yes let's sort of make a little deeper dive into mr liebler's information did you ask mr liebler about what kind of marriage she had with Mr. Morphew? Yes, we did. And what did he tell you? He said that it was something that Suzanne said was not good. Again, I don't have my, the write-ups of my interviews with Mr. Liebler in front of me. Well, that's fine. So I would be summarizing just generally speaking. Yeah, generally that it was not good, that there were lots of arguments and that, you know, she was interested in getting out of that marriage. And she said quite often to Mr. Liebler that they should be husband and wife. Did she speak of potentially getting some sort of involvement with Mr. Liebler about what was currently happening? Yeah, she said that she would eventually like to be married to him, to be husband and wife with Mr. Liebler. There was some information about Mr. Liebler and what happened to his phone and his accounts. Did you talk to him about that? When did he tell you he heard about Suzanne going missing? It was on, I believe it was May 12th, and he was sent a link from his brother. Did he do anything with his electronic media or his phone or anything? Yeah, he got rid of his accounts. His LinkedIn account? Uh-huh. Did he say anything about the WhatsApp account? I think he said he got rid of his account. Did he say why he did that? Yeah, he originally saw that the news reports said that she was on a bike ride and abducted and he thought if she was really abducted that he didn't want the news of the affair to be something that was negative for his for her daughters. Did you talk to him at all about, did you talk to Libler about what Suzanne told him about Macy and Mallory? We asked him about, there were some references to their children in the text messages as well as we can hear their names on the pen recording. And so Libler said they often talked about each other's kids and cared for what was going on with their families in conversation. Did you ask Mr. Libler if anybody else in the family or circle of friends of Suzanne had knew about him? We did. What did he tell you about that? He said no, that nobody knew and that he knew that Suzanne had told him that even Sheila, her best friend, did not know. Did you ask him to contrast himself against Barry? Did you say what kind of person you are? Yeah, he essentially said that he's the just the very opposite person to Barry. Did you ever ask Mr. Libler about the relationship and her health? Yes, he talked about the fact that their relationship was something that was affecting her health and she was concerned about it. Did 
you ever ask Mr. Libler about Suzanne ever presenting a divorce or splitting up the relationship? Yes, we did. Mr. Libler said that they had sort of an unwritten rule that they tried not to talk about like exactly where things were in each other's marriages. You recall Mr. Libler telling you that Barry told Suzanne she could not get a divorce because of biblical reasons? Yes. From Mr. Morphew? Yes. I'm going to ask you a few questions about what he knew about Suzanne's biking. You said earlier that they talked about mountain biking and he suggested getting a mountain bike and exploring the trails around Chafee County. Yes. Did he tell you when Suzanne, from his knowledge, would drive, would ride her bike most frequently? Yeah. He said his recollection, I think, was that she mostly rode in the afternoons. Yes. And would he, did he do anything to help her with picking out trails? Yes. He would sometimes look at mountain biking apps to see what were trails that were sort of her level as a beginner and then they would maybe talk about it by phone so he could explain what trails she should try. At some point there's a discussion with Mr. Libler about Fred. Yes, Suzanne talks to Mr. Libler about Fred. What did Mr. Libler tell you this discussion, this Fred discussion was all about? Yeah, Mr. Libler said that in arguments between Barry and Suzanne, that Barry would sometimes tell Suzanne something to the effect of, don't worry, someday you'll find your Fred. And in your investigation, what does it reveal? This Fred, what does that mean? Fred was the, her, was Suzanne's stepfather. So was the man who married Adrian after she had divorced from Jean Mormon, Suzanne's father. So Suzanne was saying, Barry was telling her, don't worry, someday you'll find your Fred, the person that will be for you, the same way that Fred was for Adrian after she divorced Jean. There was some information about Suzanne talking to Sheila about finding another person and moving on. Did she also tell tell Mr. Libler about this? Yes, I don't remember the exact words, but Suzanne had told Mr. Libler she was hoping that Barry would find somebody else and move on. Was there a point when Mr. Libler heard something that kind of cemented in his mind what happened? Was there a statement that was made? So, Miss Eaton, objection, Your Honor, speculation. He's asking a witness to speculate about what happened, Judge. Well, I'm assuming this is based upon something you discussed with Mr. Libler, correct? Yes, Judge. So, Mr. Lindsay, yeah, it's information that Mr. Libler heard and then commented on. Judge. Okay, then that's a proper foundation for a preliminary hearing where hearsay is admissible. You need me to repeat the question? No. Yes. So, Mr. Libler, Originally, when we asked him what he thought happened, said he was sort of on, I don't remember if this is the phrase, but on the fence about whether Barry did it or not. Then he said he heard Barry say something to the effect, Miss Eaton, objection, your honor. May we approach? Judge, yes. Miss Eaton, your honor, I'm going to object to relevance. If anything, this is especially, I don't know how it's relevant what the individual believes happened to Ms. Morphew. Judge, well, it's not speculative because it's coming from the source to the agent. And again, unless there's zero relevance, and I don't find that there's zero relevance, I don't know how relevant this is. Mr. Lindsay, let me clear that up. Do you need me to repeat the question, Agent Harris? Yeah. So Mr. Libler said originally he didn't know what to think about whether or not Barry was involved or not in Suzanne's disappearance. And he said when he heard Barry say, or it was reported that Barry said, telling me this is the most devastating thing that has ever happened to me, but I have got to keep my faith and trust in God and Suzanne trusts the Lord. And if one person got saved from this, she would think it was worth it. And we are just a godly, loving, caring family. And this thing is just a tragedy. If one person was saved through this, then she would think it's okay. That changed his mind. She being who? Suzanne. Now, Agent Harris, did you actually go over? Well, let me back up and lay a foundation here. Were you aware there was a list of grievances or a list of things that Ms. Morphew issues she had with Mr. Morphew? I'm aware 
that there was a list that was saved to her iCloud account that looks like a list of grievances. Did you show that to Mr. Libler? Yes, we did. What was his response? He primarily, we asked him some specifics about them. I don't remember, but I remember him saying that he didn't. Once he looked at the list, he didn't realize it was as bad as it was. Those are my questions of this witness at this time. I'm going to make him subject to recall, Judge. Judge, okay, Miss Eaton. Miss Eaton, thank you. Cross-examination by Miss Eaton. Good afternoon, Agent Harris. Good afternoon. I want to start with some of the summarized statements you were making regarding Sheila Oliver, okay? You described that Sheila, you spoke with Sheila numerous times. Yes. I won't talk about that, but Sheila seemed to be describing to you things that she had talked to Suzanne about more than what was in the text messages. Yes. So when you were testifying about what the text messages meant as Sheila received them? Yes. It was because Suzanne and Sheila actually talked about the text messages, not just texting each other. Is that right? Yeah, I don't know that Suzanne and Sheila talked about the text message content. Okay. So that's where I want to make sure that we're clear. You were doing a lot of interpretation of the text messages that were brought in as exhibits, correct? You were being asked what things meant, right? Yeah, according to what Sheila Oliver had said they meant, yes. And if what you were interpreting was more than was just on the text, the actual text message, you were interpreting about maybe things that Sheila and Suzanne had talked about regarding the text messages? If we mean regarding what the text messages refer to, yeah, yes, exactly. So these text messages are being sent back and forth, and we looked at text messages in September 2019, right? Yes. And we looked at text messages in March of 2020, Yes. Right. And in looking at those text messages, like you said, you know, you needed to interpret them. And Sheila was giving her interpretation based on conversations she had subsequent to those text messages with Suzanne, right? Yes. Right. But you know that Sheila Oliver doesn't have... Well, first of all, the phone records for Sheila Oliver were collected in this case pursuant to search warrant, right? I believe I know that Sheila's phone was downloaded. I don't actually know whether her phone records were collected separately from that. Okay, so you didn't go back and verify that there's no connected phone call between Sheila Oliver and Suzanne Morphew after May 2019? Did she mean May 2020 there? Side note. No, you don't know? Okay. Then, and the substance of your testimony about what Sheila Oliver has told you about Mr. Morphew and Suzanne's marriage was in this interview you just had with her a month ago, right? No. Some of that content is in other reports as well, in terms of some of the things she's saying about their marriage, yes. Uh-huh. But you had a pretty lengthy and involved interview with her in July of 2021, and your report is there in front of you, is that right? Or maybe the DA showed it to you? Yeah. Sheila was talking about her text messages with me and then provided the screen recordings for them. Uh-huh. And that was a year after Mr. Morphew was arrested for murdering her best friend, right? Yes. Another side note. I don't know why Iris Eaton asked this question. She's saying that was a year after Mr. Morphew was arrested for murdering her best friend. Barry Morphew was just arrested in May of 2021. A year after that would be May of 2022. I don't understand her timeline. Back to the transcripts. Okay. So now, let's talk about some of the things you talked about with Jeff Libler. You said that you were talking about the LinkedIn messages that were exchanged between Suzanne Morphew and Jeff Libler, right? Yes, and you were. You provided the court with interpretation of what some of those LinkedIn messages were based on your conversation with Jeff Libler, right? I think I provided places where we asked Jeff specifically about some of them, yes. Right. And so you talked to Jeff Libler on November 4th by phone, right? Yes. And you talked to Jeff Libler in person in Michigan near his home. Yes. On November 13th, 2020, right? Yes. Now the search warrant for the LinkedIn messages were on November 25th, 2020, right? 
Yes. And the return was on December 17th, 2020, correct? Yes. So Mr. Libler had destroyed and deleted his LinkedIn account so he couldn't show it to you on November 13th, right? Correct. So when did you talk to Mr. Libler after December 17th, 2020? So we had a phone call or two afterwards once we received the records and we sent him some of the messages, particularly from May 9th. Okay. And did you write a report about those conversations? We did. Is it recorded? I don't think that one is recorded. Okay. And how long was that conversation? Actually, I think that conversation was one where we talked to him, asked him if we could send it to him, and then talk afterwards. It was a fairly brief conversation. How brief was that conversation? I don't remember off the top of my head. I don't remember. 10 or 15 minutes? Do you have a record of that in front of you? I do not. Do you know approximately the date? I do not. Was it in 2020? after you received the return on the December 17th or was it in 2021? I don't recall whether it was in 2020 or 2021, but it would have been fairly soon after receiving the records. So you sent him the LinkedIn messages? We sent him just some lines on May 9th to ask him about them. Okay, so it's evident from your investigation and what you do is you're trying to understand who people are, their backgrounds, and what they're about in terms of your job to put the pieces together from, I guess, a victimology standpoint. Is that right? Yes. And so what you discovered was that Suzanne kept a lot of secrets. Can you explain what you mean by a lot? Yeah, she kept the biggest secret of an affair that she had from every single person she knew, right? Yes. And her sister, Melinda Baumunk, also said that Suzanne was very good at keeping secrets, right? I don't recall. You don't recall seeing that? I mean, in doing your review of talking to the people and reading reports of people, especially her sister, I'm sure you reviewed a report where Detective Burgess did an interview of Miss Baumunk. Did you review that? Yes, I did. It sounds like something that Melinda said I just don't recall it specifically. Okay, so you would recall that Suzanne, that her sister, her own sister, said that she was good at keeping secrets, right? Like I said, I know I reviewed it. It sounds like something that Melinda may have said. I don't remember specifically that she said that, but sure, it doesn't sound out of the realm of something that she would have said about Suzanne. Okay. Now this affair, as we've heard, was not a one-night stand or even a two-month fling, right? Correct. The affair was with Jeff Libler, who lives in an entirely different state, in Michigan, right? Correct. And it was two years long. Yes. And it was still, well, fully active and involved on the day that Suzanne went missing. Sorry. On the two years, it was, it started around... He reached out in September of 2018 through to the last communication on May 9th. So a year and a half, not two years. Okay. And I guess for clarification, you're basing that on what Mr. Libler said, right? Yes. All right. So this affair was fully active and involved until the day Suzanne went missing, right? Yes. And as we talked about, you interviewed not only people like Sheila Oliver, her best friend, but also Holly Wilson, who also was another good friend of Suzanne's, correct? Yes. And as we talked about, her sister, Ms. Baumunk, was also interviewed, right? Yes. And Ms. Oliver and Ms. Wilson are both purportedly people that Suzanne told everything to, right? Well, they were. Sheila was somebody that she was very close to and told a lot but not everything. Right, she didn't tell everything to. Ms. Oliver was a college roommate of Suzanne Morphew, right? Correct. And said that we were the best of friends and we talked, right? Yes, but it was clear from your interviews of Holly Wilson, Melinda Baumunk, and Sheila Oliver that Suzanne did not tell them the truth about her two-year affair with Mr. Libler, right? Yeah, I don't know that any of them ever asked her whether she was having an affair, but she never disclosed it to them. Right. She never mentioned a male friend to anybody. Not anybody that we interviewed, no. In fact, it would have been hard for them to believe that Suzanne would have an affair. Correct. Sheila was even asked if while there was some overlap between Suzanne's secret flame with Mr. Libler in Florida in February 2020 and her visit with Sheila in Florida in 2020, if Sheila had any idea that something else was going on and she said no. Is that right? Correct. 
and you didn't find out about Mr. Libler and the extent of their relationship until November 2020, right? Yes. We, I don't remember what the date of finding the recording on the recording pen, so we knew. It sounded like there was somebody with the first name Jeff, but we didn't know who that was until November, correct? And prior to that, both Miss Oliver and Ms. Wilson had been interviewed multiple times by law enforcement. Yes, I believe so. And in fact, after you discover the depth of this relationship with Mr. Libler, you didn't just interview Ms. Oliver or Ms. Wilson, you actually worked with them to record secret conversations. Well, not secret, but conversations that they were having with Mr. Morphew, is that right? With Ms. Wilson, she was recording those conversations on her own at first for some time, and then yes, she eventually recorded on our behalf. And then with Ms. Oliver, it was, they were coming out for the visit on their own and offered if we wanted to be able to record the conversation and there was just that one conversation that they recorded. Uh-huh. So yes. So they work with you. And what do you call those people? Do you call them confidential informants or what do you call them in the FBI? So in the case of Ms. Oliver, she was not a confidential human source, but Ms. Wilson was. And when they, when they were conducting these secret recordings of Mr. Morphew, you did not advise them of the secret love affair that Suzanne had with Jeff Libler? No, we had played a portion of audio for each of them to see whether they knew who it was, but we didn't disclose anything about what we thought about the nature of that particular person, just that it was somebody that she was talking to. And I think both of them at that point possibly felt like it was, that there was something there, but we did not disclose anything further. But we knew about the pen recording content. So, they had heard the voice of Jeff Libler, but they didn't understand the depth of the relationship that Ms. Morphew had with Jeff Libler. Is that right? Correct. And you didn't tell them that for the prior year and a half, two years, that Ms. Morphew was having this affair, Mr. Lindsay. Object, judge. Asked and answered, judge. I think he's answered the question, but go ahead. Yeah, correct, Miss Eaton. Okay. So is it fair to say that you actually used Sheila Oliver to help you in this homicide investigation? Well, Sheila Oliver contacted us to say that she wanted to finally come out and asked if there was a way she could help, and we took her up on that offer. Yes. Okay. So she had, she wanted to help in trying to, in your investigation, which was a homicide investigation of Mr. Morphew. Yes, Sheila specifically wanted to help in whatever way that she could. I don't, in Sheila's mind, that was without making up her mind to say exactly what happened, but she wanted to help in the investigation, yes. Well, and something that you were doing in your investigation was that if you believed that Mr. Morphew had knowledge of this affair or of Mr. Libler, that he would have motive to kill her, right? Yes, and Sheila had no inkling of an affair or of Jeff Libler, correct? Correct. Holly Wilson didn't have any inkling or information about an affair with Jeff Libler. Is that right? Correct. And you don't have any information that Barry Morphew had any inkling about an affair with Jeff Libler. Mr. Morphew has told us that he did not know about it. He did say at some point that he was suspicious of potentially an emotional affair, but not a physical affair. And there are some things, I think there are some questions about that, so he has told us he did not know. And you didn't. You don't have any documentation, any kind of text messages between... We'll get to that. Hold on a minute. Let me get to the spy pin that you referred to before. So law enforcement learned about this affair, not the depths of it, but the fact that there was some kind of loving relationship that Ms. Morphew was having outside of her marriage after finding a spy pin at the Morphew home. Is that right? Yes. It took some time to be able to listen to the audio and capture the content that gave us that, but yes. Okay, well, let's get back to the like the creation or how this spy pen came into play. In January, late January 2020, early February 2020, Suzanne told Sheila that she wanted a spy pen to record Barry, correct? Correct. But Suzanne did not tell Sheila why or what she hoped to record, correct? I don't recall whether she didn't tell her at all 
what she wanted to record? Well, she was. When Ms. Oliver was interviewed by Detective Burgess on May 12th, Sheila Oliver said, quote, I think she was hoping to catch some conversation or just like to have some witness of something. I don't know if she really went into a lot of detail in what she was wanting, but she was hoping to put it in his truck, end quote. That sound correct? Yes. And she told Agent Graham that she thought she could hear him on a phone talking to someone. Is that right? I don't recall the content of Agent Graham's interview. Okay, so Agent Graham interviewed her on July 28th, 2020. Okay. Did you review that interview? Yes, at some point, yes. Okay, so would you like to see see that statement, please, Miss Eaton? Your Honor, it's three o'clock. May we have an afternoon break and I'll find this? Is that all right for the court? Is this an appropriate time for a break? Judge Murphy, it doesn't matter. I was going to take one about 3.15, but if that, it would save us some time so you can... Miss Eaton, yeah. Judge, find that while we're on break. Miss Eaton, that would be great. Judge, okay, so we will be in recess until 10 after. There was a pause in the proceedings from 3.01 p.m. to 3.15 p.m. The clerk, all rise. The judge, thank you, please be seated. Miss Eaton, your honor, may we approach real briefly? Judge, yeah. Miss Eaton, it appears we could be wrong, but we've checked with our discovery people. Everyone has been looking on our drives and we can't find the report that Agent Harris referred to talking to Mr. Libler after. I asked the prosecution if they could please point us to it and they provided us a copy so we're copying it right now your honor and I would ask for the prosecution to tell us where it was produced so that we can confirm whether we did receive or we didn't. That's all I'm asking. Judge are you able to do that? Mr. Lindsay, my understanding from what Agent Harris said is the initial batch of discovery that was produced early on. You can shake your head all you want, but it was in there. Mr. Lindsay apparently is saying to Barry's lawyer, you can shake your head no all you want, but it was in there because she keeps complaining about stuff missing from the discovery. In my personal opinion, I think the discovery is just so huge and probably unorganized that they can't find stuff that they've likely already been given. Anyway, <laughs> back on the record of the court transcripts. You can shake your head all you want, but it was in there in that batch of discovery, Judge Murphy. And I don't have any way of confirming, Miss Eaton. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I just... Judge Murphy. Okay, the record should reflect all parties and counsel are back in the courtroom. Agent Harris is on the witness stand. Go ahead, Miss Eaton. Thank you, Your Honor. Agent Harris, on the break, I inquired about this. An interview with Mr. Libler that occurred after the search warrant linked in return came in. Is that right? Yes. And you provided me with a two-page, one-and-a-half-page summary of that call that you had with Mr. Libler on December 18th, 2020, right? Yes. And then three pages extracted LinkedIn messages from the LinkedIn return. Is that right? Correct. And it looks like you spoke with Mr. Libler about a few of the messages in the LinkedIn return. You didn't send him all of them. You just sent him a selected few. Is that right? Correct. So I want to get back to the spy pen. Sheila never indicated that Suzanne wanted the spy pen to catch Mr. Morphew because he was abusive or because she wanted to catch him in some argument or in some type of volatile state. Is that right? I don't remember Sheila saying that. And Sheila, Suzanne asked Sheila to have it mailed to her at her house so that she could keep it a secret from Mr. Morphew, right? Yes. Suzanne told Sheila that she was concerned as to what Barry's reaction would be if he saw it come to the house. So then Sheila received the spy pen in Indiana and she brought it with her to Florida, right? That's what she told us, yes. And then she told you that she gave the spy pen to Ms. Morphew down in Florida, right? Correct. And Suzanne never told Sheila if she used it. I don't recall Sheila ever saying that she knew that Suzanne used it. Okay, so as you described a little bit, there were multiple files on the spy pen, right? Correct. And files meaning audio files. Yes. And what happens with a spy pen is, like my colleague said, Miss Nielsen said, it looked like a regular black pen, but you can plug it into a port and you can download the content of what has been recorded on the pen, right? Yeah, I've seen a photograph of the pen. That's what it looks like, yes. And the pen also appears to, for purposes of being secretive, 
it activates upon hearing voices. Is that right? That's the way it's been described. It appears from the files that it activates by something because it doesn't seem like there's Suzanne or somebody else manipulating it to turn it on when it comes on. So yes. Okay, so when you review these files, there were 11 deleted files and there were 11 saved files, right? I don't remember the numbers. That sounds about right. Yes. Okay, and two of the files, and this was before... This wasn't, this wasn't law enforcement deleting the files. This had to have been whoever was in possession of the spy pen, who was Suzanne, right? That's my understanding, yes. And it appears that there were two files that were able to be recovered that were deleted by purportedly Ms. Morphew that were recovered on the spy pen, is that right? Yes. And again, I don't remember the number specifically, but I remember seeing just a couple that were in the deleted category that were, that we could hear the audio, yes. Do you recall which two those were? I believe one of them was the one with Mr. Libler on it. I do not remember what the second one was. Okay, now the law enforcement found the spy pen because Ms. Oliver let law enforcement know that she had worked with Ms. Morphew to get her a spy pen, right? I don't actually know how that came about. Okay, so prior to, there was actually a search for the spy pen because of Ms. Oliver's information. You don't recall that? I do not. Okay. So the spy pen is found in the master closet of Ms. Morphew's house, right? I did hear that it was found, yes, in her closet. Okay, and on June 2nd, 2020, that's when CBI agent Graham learned from Chafee County detective, I can't say her name, Hishlin. I've looked it up on Google, Hishlin. Hishlin? Hishlin, thank you. Hishlin discovered a conversation on that spy pen dating back to February 2020, right? If this is from a report, I'm just not recollecting it. Okay, so does it sound from your conversation that the detective heard this conversation between Suzanne and a person named Jeff who had two children named... Yes, if I remember, I don't know that Sergeant Hishlin, when she first heard it, I think she did not yet know that there was a name Jeff on there. I don't remember whether that was the case or not in terms of when, whether she... So I just don't recall whether she was the one that already had heard Jeff before we started listening more in depth with several of us. Okay, let me see if I can refresh your recollection. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Thank you. Maybe this will refresh your recollection in looking at the June 1st, 2020. Okay, yes. So without asking the question again, does that refresh? Yes, your recollection. So on June 2nd, it becomes apparent that there is recording with someone that seems like it's a more intimate nature from the conversation. Is that right? Correct. And what could also be heard in the recording that you described was you could hear recording happening while a truck, well, it was in a car, perhaps a truck. Is that right? Correct. Okay, so the recording with Jeff that was found on the spy pen. Sorry, can I ask just for a clarification? Yes. The truck car noise. Are you talking about the same recording or a separate one? A separate recording. Okay, yes. Okay, so let's go back to the Jeff recording, okay? The Jeff recording was on February 2nd, 2020. Yes, I believe that's what we were able to figure out. It was recorded on. Okay, and it was on while Suzanne was away from Colorado on a trip when she was with Sheila Oliver on a girl's trip and they were watching the Super Bowl. This recording was created around that time. There's a separate recording that has the Super Bowl on it around the same time, yes. Okay, and in this conversation with Mr. Libler that we know now is Mr. Libler, but the recording you hear Suzanne say, quote, maybe we are in the clear for Valentine's Day. Barry won't be around. Is that right? Yes, I remember. And Suzanne saying, quote, You are not a homewrecker. You're my lover and my sweet friend and the man I love dearly, okay? And I'm your woman, end quote. You recall that? Yes, I will say the quality of the audio is very hard to hear. So with the, but I listened to it many times, that's what I remember hearing. Okay. And Suzanne also said in the same recording, quote, I'm looking at the man who makes me happy. Jeff, baby, I love you so much. I'll message you in a little bit, end quote. Is that right? Again, yes. It's very, 
I don't know if you've listened to it, but the audio is very difficult to hear. So presuming that's what we are able to get out of it, and that's what you were able to transcribe from the recording into a report. Yes, is that right? That's right. Okay. So part of this secret recording on February 2nd was also Suzanne Morphew leaving and playing messages. Leaving messages for Jeff Libler, playing messages that Jeff Libler was leaving her on some social media app, right? Yes, that's what it appears to be. You can hear her recording a message. That's a little bit harder to hear. But then she plays the message back. It seems to come over the car. Obviously, there's no video, so we can't tell. But that appears to be what's happening. Yes, it's messages she's sending and then receiving and listening to from. And it sounds like the same voice as Mr. Libler. And one of the messages that Ms. Morphew is leaving for Mr. Libler, and you can hear her leaving this message is, quote, while you were gone, he was asking me what I was using. A lot of things were off. It's not stressful. Difficulty with his sisters. Talking about not being a big deal. Not being with Barry for Valentine's Day two years in a row. Love you, end quote. That sound right? Yes. And then she listens to a message that Jeff Libler leaves her numerous times. The message is, quote, you are the sweetest thing I've ever known, end quote. Do you recall that? You can look at the transcript if that yeah, I think. Do you have a timestamp roughly? Yes, I think it's, look at page 23 of your report. Side note, sounds like Jeff Libler left her this message. Jeff Libler said to Suzanne, you are the sweetest thing I've ever known. That is actually a song lyric from one of my favorite Lauren Hill songs off the Love Jones soundtrack titled The Sweetest Thing. So I wonder if that's why he said that. Back in the court transcripts, sorry, mine does not have page numbers on it, but it has the timestamps. Oh, okay, timestamp 311 through 314. I see it. Okay. And Suzanne leaves a voice memo back for Mr. Libler saying, quote, Baby, I've known from the beginning that we are perfect for each other. You are perfect for me. End quote. Is that right? Yes. And then another message, quote, Cannot live my life without you in it. End quote. Right? Yeah, I think mine has to not my life without you in it, but it sounds like what she was trying to say there, yes. And she leaves him another message, quote, This is what I want coming into the end of our lives. This is what I want. I want those things that are lasting. Your heart, who you are, that's what I crave. Just this person I love. I love how you love me. I love how you think. I love we can get through, end quote. I think there's a typo in there in the transcription, but, quote, I'm sure of it. Is that right? Yeah, mine says, quote, I'm sure of that. And Mr. Libler responded to the message, and he says, quote, you have no idea what you're getting yourself into with me. I'm emotional. I'm more emotional than I should be, end quote, right? Yes, I see it. And Suzanne, he says, another message to Suzanne, quote, Suzanne, I love you. I love the way you do not change. You're not more emotional or anything than you should be. I love you, end quote, right? Well, you're not more emotional or anything than you should be, end quote. And then mine goes on, quote, I know you've heard that from somebody else, but I don't, end quote. It doesn't then go to I love you in mine. Okay, but the first part that you read, yes. And just as there's another message, quote, Baby, you are a sweetheart, and oh, this boy craves you. Just about everything about you. Love you and hope to see you, end quote. Yes, it was evident from this spy pen recording that was recovered that Suzanne was having a romantic relationship with this person named Jeff, right? That's the inference we drew. Yes, and CBI, the DA's office, the FBI issued 50 search warrants before November of 2020 and hadn't figured out who this Jeff was, right? Yes, I don't know. I'll take your word on the number of search warrants, but yes. This is because Suzanne created accounts, secret accounts, right? Yes. 
and all the resources that the CBI, FBI, and the DA's office had weren't able to identify who this person was, right? Yeah, up to the point of finding the spy pen recording, yes, we didn't have any record of it. Without the spy pen recording, there was, there's no other investigation that has been conducted to this point a year, almost a year and two months later, that would have revealed this affair. Is that correct? Yes. I think there was maybe Mr. Libler's number showed up in one of the social media accounts on something that had no name or label that was searched later, but otherwise, no. So, Suzanne's secret spy pen led you to Suzanne's secret affair. Correct. So, law enforcement, you and I think Agent Krusing called Mr. Libler on November 2nd, 2020, right? Yes. Where Mr. Libler admitted that he was the Jeff that knew Suzanne Morphew. Yes, and Mr. Libler agreed to interview with both of you on November 13th, 2020. Yes, and both of you and Agent Grusing flew to Michigan to interview him, correct? Correct. And at that point, you had the secret pen recording, but you did not know the extent of the relationship. Correct. Jeff Libler did not come forward and tell anybody he had been communicating with Suzanne. Correct. Jeff Libler claimed his phone got destroyed immediately after Suzanne went missing and lost all his communications he had with her, correct? I don't know if he said it was immediately after she went missing, but his, yeah, the work phone that he had was destroyed after he after she went missing yes he claimed that to be true right yes you never verified that correct I think we asked him whether he still had it when it was destroyed if he what he got in replacement if there was any way that he had access to them and he said no sure and he deleted all of his secret accounts and proof of communication he had with Miss Morphew after Miss Morphew went missing, correct? Yes. Suzanne and Jeff both were in the practice of deleting their WhatsApp messages every time they were done communicating so there wouldn't be a trace on their phone. So they were both doing that throughout. And then they would reload it when they were going to talk again but it would erase all the communications. But he did erase his LinkedIn account afterwards. And you didn't go to Mr. Jeff Libler's work, who was in, I guess, paid for this phone or replaced the phone to confirm Mr. Libler's version to you? We did not. He told you that the phone that he had on May 9th and 10th didn't exist anymore, right? Right. That he deleted his account, correct. And he claimed that he did this because he didn't want Suzanne Morphew's legacy to be that she had an affair with this guy, right? Correct. But he also said that he was protecting himself too, correct? He said he couldn't even try to sign back into his accounts because they're gone, right? That sounds familiar, but if I could just look at where he says that in the report, this was on 11-13 and the time of the interview was two hours and 22 minutes in Indiana. Or no, two minutes and 22 seconds. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just not seeing a two minute, 22 seconds. Okay, why don't we listen to the words of Mr. Libler? Audio played, Mr. Lindsay. I'm not sure what is the question about this. A lot of this has already been testified to by the witness. Ms. Eaton, it's true, it's true, we're having technical problems audio played. Miss Eaton. So it was very hard to hear. Almost impossible, actually. Not as impossible as the pen recording, probably. But would you dispute that the texting from the recording says you asked if he'd be able to sign back into the count and see if it's still there. He said he tried. You asked if he tried it and it's gone. He said it gives me an error. The account is gone. Yes, I saw that text. I don't remember the context which account we were talking to him about. Were we asking him about LinkedIn? Yes. Okay, yes. So also something that you wanted to obtain was his phone records, right? Yes. And you wanted to obtain his phone records to see, you know, verify if what he was telling you was true, right? Yes. And to see the extent of the relationship from what you could gather from a phone record, right? Yes. But you only got the phone records to December 2019, is that correct? I don't believe that's correct. I believe we got phone records all the way through to the present day of the search warrant. Okay, the search warrant only has until December of 2019. Was there a reason for that? I don't recall the search warrant only going to 2019 because we have records. I believe that we asked our cast person 
to say where was Mr. Libler's phone hitting off of and he gave us Michigan Towers on May 10th. Miss Eaton, may I have a moment, Your Honor? Miss Eaton, the only people that knew about that there was some kind of affair between Jeff Libler and somebody else was Jeff Libler's brother and his daughter, right? No, I believe in, I forget the time frame of this, I think in around Thanksgiving of 2018. So when they were talking, but had not yet traveled to see each other, Mr. Libler's daughter took his phone when he was, she was trying to order pizza and she saw communications and he told us that she told, I believe it was his two older sons and her uncle. So yes, one of his brothers. And to date, you have not interviewed his brother or the daughter, correct? Correct. And you didn't obtain Mr. Libler's computer to search for any information that you could obtain from there. Is that correct? Correct. And at the time of the interview on November, in November 2020, he had not told his wife yet about the secret affair. Correct. So the beginning of this affair, as you said, started with getting a message from Suzanne out of the blue on Facebook saying, Hey stranger, right? Yes, I don't remember if Mr. Libler remembered for sure which platform it was, but he thought it was Facebook, yes. And they started to talk and Suzanne actually suggested using a secret app called Boxer, I think they mean Voxer there, to secretly communicate, right? She suggested Boxer to communicate. I don't know that Boxer is particularly secret, but she did suggest it to him. And Mr. Liebler claimed to use it once or twice. Then they switched to using cell phones to talk, correct? Correct. And this is all coming from Mr. Libler's version, correct? Correct. Mr. Libler told you that he'd always carried a torch for Suzanne since college. Correct. And not only did Suzanne Morphew not tell anybody about this affair, she didn't even write about it in a journal or anything that was tangible. You didn't find any clues toward an affair with Jeff Libler in writing. Yes, there's a journal that we understand someone described her having that we did not find. But in the journals that we did find, there's no references. So Mr. Libler claimed that after his daughter discovered something going on between Mr. Libler and a woman that they stopped communicating completely, right? Yes, for a time. And that he actually said that he deleted all his apps, including Facebook and Instagram, and text with her to eliminate any ability for anyone to find anything out about them, right? Correct. And you said that soon after that, around December 2018, early 2019, Suzanne reached out to him, finding him on a LinkedIn account, right? Yes, I believe he said it was around Christmas. And then Mr. Libler said that at that point they started it up again, right? Correct. But actually, because you have Mr. Libler's phone records during that time period, you know that they were talking consistently, almost daily between November 15th and the end of December. Is that right? The phone records show that they were talking by phone, yes. So it's not true that they stopped communicating because his daughter found out about them, right? I don't know that it's not true that they... Mr. Lindsay, objection on that not true part. Judge, I'm sorry, there were two people talking. Mr. Lindsay, I object to defense counsel's characterization of the not true part. Judge, it's the same objection one of you two made earlier. Miss Eaton, why is that? So I mean, what he stated earlier was not true to what the evidence has shown. Judge, I think what we're trying to do, since I have to, I'm the trier of fact I have to figure out what's true and not true. Just use a different word than true. Miss Eaton, okay. Truth will not be used in the courtroom. Miss Eaton, I will use the evidence shows. Judge, there you go. Miss Eaton, that the phone records, that there was a lot of communication going on between them between November 2018 and December 2019, right? By phone, yes, by phone, yeah. And one of the ways that they were communicating in 2018 is through LinkedIn, right? So Jeff remembers her reaching back out by LinkedIn, but I don't know that they were communicating by LinkedIn all the way from 2018 to 2020. Okay, so one of the things that you did was you tried to grab Suzanne's LinkedIn messages from a search warrant, right? Yes, and you were able to get some information from LinkedIn, right? Correct. You couldn't get it from his LinkedIn account because he had deleted it, right? Yes, the one that was labeled Jeffrey SL. Yes, right. 
but hers came back with LinkedIn messages that you spoke with Mr. Libler about that date back to approximately April 2020, right? Yes, but it also shows how many times and when Ms. Morphew created the LinkedIn account and how often she logged into the account, right? Yes, and Ms. Morphew logged into this LinkedIn account that she created in August 2018 multiple times from August 2018 up until she goes missing. Is that right? I don't have that date in front of me, but it sounds right. Yes. Okay, so that's another thing that Mr. Libler may not have been so accurate about when he was telling you his version of events, right? Which, that they were not talking by LinkedIn? Right. I don't know that they were talking by LinkedIn. You just know that she was logging in a lot and started her account in August 2018, right? Yes. Okay, let's break right here. We'll close out and come back with additional snippet of Barry Morphew's first preliminary hearing court transcripts. Let's close with Colossians 1.28. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Thank you as always for watching. Take care.